Welcome once again to EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest author is Joseph Scheidler, author of Racketeer for Life, Fighting the Culture of Death from the Sidewalk to the Supreme Court, published by Tan Books, available, of course, through our catalog as well. A pleasure to meet you, sir. A legend in the pro-life movement. I think it's fair to say, uh, especially some people might not recognize you immediately because you don't have your traditional hat on at the same <laughs> time. But people can tell from the cover of the book that that is definitely you. And uh, you put this book together, and I noticed one thing. It's listed as a memoir. What does it mean to say it's versus an autobiography as opposed to being a memoir. Why was it listed as a memoir? We just like the word better. Okay. It's, uh, it, uh, it's sort of um, a nostalgia. It brings mm -hmm. a, a memoir. You think of somebody, you know, that's done something that, that people should know about and that, that, that's important enough to them <clears throat> to be part of their life. Right. And, well, right in the beginning of the book, you kind of talk <clears throat> about, this is the way I remember the early days that prepared me for the raging battle to save the lives of the unborn. It is, of course, an abridged history. This is the way I remember the people I work with and planned with and went to jail with. This is the way I remember the enemy we're still fighting. I used all the tools at my disposal to check, double check, and recheck my facts to tell the most accurate story I could. But your point is, what you're saying is, this is the best I can remember. Because you do point out in the book, which many people do realize, memory is a funny thing. It takes impressions of the stories we find ourselves a part of. I like this analogy, like metal in soft wax. Right. And, and you say yourself, I've often been surprised at what I'd forgotten or that what had happened wasn't quite the way I remembered it. Did you find that a lot or just with I'm, you? I'm finding that now. People will, will call me up or they'll, they'll be furious that I, I gave credit to somebody else and they were really the ones that, mm -hmm. that started a, the lock and block, for instance. Okay. I got the wrong on that. And uh, <clears throat> pardon me, also you'll have people who you don't write enough about. You mention them in the book. You tell what they do, but you're, that's not the point of that chapter, and so you, that's all you say. Mm -hmm. Well, they're in the book, but but they're doing great things, mm -hmm. and they should write their own book. Mm -hmm. There was a guy in New York that had crisis pregnancy centers, and they were fabulous, and mm -hmm. I visited him, and oh, I mentioned him in the book. Mm -hmm. But but that he has these centers, but not the fact that he had all the numbers on his phone, and that they would a girl would call and they'd help. He could pinpoint her right to that clinic, things like that. That wasn't my purpose, but I've offended people. I realize that. Right. It's interesting, too, and sometimes, because, I mean, it's it's all, I mean, pride is the great sin of all. Oh, yeah. But sometimes you feel like saying, well, did you do it so you'd be remembered in a book, or did you do it because you thought it was the right thing to do? Right. And I'm assuming you did it for the latter, for, I, for the right thing to do, and uh, the fact that you may not have gotten mentioned in the book, I guess, is something that maybe tweaks our pride a little bit, but at the end of the day, well, what does it mean? Uh, that's, he was honest. Right. He, he was disappointed, mm -hmm. and he told me. And right. I appreciate that, and I would, if I rewrote the book, I'd say more. Right. But you have to, like I said, this is the way I remember it. Mm -hmm. This was important, but it wasn't the main thing at that, that time that right. we were doing. Right. And uh, I've always been for crisis pregnancy centers, right. and, and that's obvious, but I don't run one. I go out in front of them. Right. We talk to the women. We've talked them out of abortions. We send them to a crisis pregnancy center, and they, they right. take care of them. Right. Uh, I'm not a counselor, not a good counselor. But mm -hmm. uh, Did you try I, to be a counselor mm -hmm. one time and found out you weren't good at it? Uh, I did counsel sort of off the cuff. Mm -hmm. I would meet somebody and say, I don't want you to have this abortion. Don't go in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's dangerous, and so on. And then I'd say, let's go have a cup of coffee and talk about your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, he's probably not a good guy anyway. If he sent you to have an abortion, that would be her excuse. And so it was sort of an off-the-cuff counselor. I never took a course in it or mm -hmm. anything like that, but you would just not. And, and I liked it, talking to the doctors, too. We brought a lot of doctors around. And when you take a Tony Levitino out of abortion or Nathan, uh, uh, Bernard Nathanson, Nathanson and so on. Right, right. You, you've got, you've stopped thousands of abortions. Were you, were you involved <clears throat> with uh, Bernard Nathan, Nathanson leaving? Uh, you know, I met Nathanson in Indianapolis at a party, and uh, I, uh, we were in the same hotel. Mm -hmm. And I said, Bernie, I don't trust you. I, I don't stand when everybody else does. I don't applaud because I don't. You don't sound real sincere to me. He said, Joe, let's go have a drink mm -hmm. in the bar there. He said, I've, I've wiped out a city. Mm -hmm. I've killed 70,000, including my own child. And he said, if I let myself really concentrate on that and let that come out of my talk, I, I'd be suicidal. Right. He said, suicide runs in my family. I, so I got a compassion mm -hmm. for him. 
And so many of the, I've stayed with Tony Levitino mm -hmm. uh, when he was out, he was out in Arizona. Uh, we knew him from New York and so on. Uh, knew his uh, wife and mm -hmm. his, his, we never met his little daughter. He lost a daughter and that's what helped bring him out of, right. he thought, I'm holding my own little dead daughter in my arms and I'm killing other people's children. So it was very important to have contact with the abortionists and um, meet with them. Right. We, we were invited into an abortion clinic just the other day right. because a woman wanted to show us that she didn't have surgical abortions anymore. Mm -hmm. And she was just giving out the pill. I said, well, that's still abortion. Yeah, but they take that home and right. they don't do it here. And uh, the abortions themselves, I've gone to their conventions. Right. I met uh, Tiller, mm -hmm. uh, right. took a cab ride with him. <clears throat> and he was very, very open and uh, they love it. Well, uh, current Dr. Uh, Warren, is it Warren Curry, mm -hmm. um, who's a photographer and everything else, is proud of his abortions. Right. It's interesting, too, because you do say in the book that mm -hmm. we, you went out of your way many times to go and kind of meet the abortion, whatever, and you found that many of them were not very particularly happy at the time that they were in this line of work. That's right. right. They, they knew it was wrong. Right. And it was interesting that an abortionist would have a cutoff date, maybe. And he would be as, as adamantly opposed to abortion beyond that as we are all abortions. Mm -hmm. And anybody who did an abortion after 20 weeks was, mm -hmm. was a murderer, right. was a culprit. And it, that, that seems strange. They had in their own right. mind. They had their <coughs> own sense of morality there that they had set up for themselves that <coughs> sways their own guilt probably. Right. 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 You ran into everything. And mm -hmm. so that's why I say it's a memoir. I can't put it all in right. there. It's 44 years of of meeting these people and and uh, going here right. and there and so on, meeting with other pro-lifers, finding many pro-lifers don't want to right. use the pictures. Right. Now here we also talk about the fact, right in the book, you talk about sidewalk to Supreme Court. And that connection comes where you, where you start off writing chapter one. In the spring of 1987, I flipped over one of my pro-life action league business cards and wrote, sorry, I missed you. Right. Why was that such an important thing that didn't come back to you, haunt you until March of 98? Because what they wanted it to mean was, sorry, I missed you. I okay. shot at you and I missed you. Mm -hmm. I tried to burn your clinic down and the fire went out and so on. That was the image they wanted. And they put out a film, brought in a Finnish company to, to put out a film called Racketeer, mm -hmm. or called, called uh, Holy Terror, the mm -hmm. Holy Terror. And I was, I was the Holy Terror behind the shooting, bombings, fire, and so on. And it, 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 it's very interesting to me that I didn't even know about these things. I knew the people. I knew the people that ultimately went over the edge and burned clinics and bombed and even shot at abortionists. I had to take one picture out of my book because I was having lunch with one of these guys who turned into uh, turned to violence. Really? Okay. And uh, I was never for violence. In my first book, Closed, I have a whole chapter on why violence Right. In fact, work. it's interesting because Tan, the publisher, right in the beginning makes that point clear right, right. that in publishing this book, you never advocated violence. Right. That's important and, and that's true. Violence is counterproductive and the violence, I went to these places after they'd been bombed and burned out and so on and people could have been killed. Right. Even, even though the bombers were, were pro-life and they were very careful to call up, make sure nobody was in the building, no guard was around, so on. Still, uh, one, one that hit me was a bomb that went off on the front porch of a clinic in, in Baltimore area, and shrapnel had blown out. Mm -hmm. Somebody could have been out walking their dog right. or, or coming home from a, a party or something and hit by some of that shrapnel. Right. That's dangerous. Right. That's not what you do. And, and I make that right. clear in the book but the abortionists had to have that the image, ends, and so they the used... The ends does not justify the means, right. regardless of what a solo let's keep believes. Right. Right? Well, I made them change that in there, yeah. because it's unjust, yeah, a, right. a, a proper end, a good end does not, does not allow... Right. An, uh, Let me ask you, you know, you're, you're well known, you're, you're attached to the, from, from way back when. You, in 1973, you were working as an account executive in a public relations firm, so you didn't go to college to be a pro-life advocate. Oh, no. What did you think you were going to be doing it with your life? I thought I'd be teaching at Notre Dame mm -hmm. uh, when I got the, when I got the bid because I love Notre Dame. I love teaching. I taught speech. I taught layout and design. I did a little writing, but mostly you know news writing. Mm -hmm. um, I love Notre Dame, and I thought that's where I'd settle down mm -hmm. and be. 
but I, I needed another degree. So I went up to Marquette, got a master's degree, and came back to Notre Dame, and they had got a substitute for me, and they liked him. I could have talked myself mm -hmm. back to my job, but I, I was a little tired of South Bend. Mm -hmm. It's great during the football season, but after that, Not you, go to, you yeah. go to Chicago for the movies and plays <laughs> and stuff, so I thought, I love Chicago because the coming back and forth from Marquette, I went through Chicago. You're from Indiana went, originally. I'm from a little town in Hartford City, Indiana. Right, right, right. And so I fell in love with Chicago. Mm -hmm. So I just tried out for uh, girls' schools in Chicago. I was sick of guys. I'd been in the Navy, oh, okay. the seminary, the monastery, <laughs> Notre Dame. Yeah, well, the you, had, you, had, you, you talk about in the <laughs> book, you, you thought you had a vocation, right? I did. Uh, the one, one guy thought, though, that the vocation director thought if you could be a priest, the only one type you could be would be a monk. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But you weren't interested in being a monk. Not really. Not really. I loved I loved the diocesan and, and all the seminary and they were good buddies. It's, it was a spree de corps in the seminary like the army or anywhere mm -hmm. else, only better. And uh, I really didn't want to be a monk by the time he told me mm -hmm. I should be a and but his his argument was you probably will never get ordained unless you're a monk. Right. Right, but then you also went through one of those review processes, which it's amazing, what, in the late 50s they gave right. you sodium pentothal? Right, right. I saw a movie just the other day where they gave a little gal sodium pentothal. It was an old movie. They used to right. do that. Yeah, the truth, truth serum. serum. Right, yeah. And they ask a whole bunch of questions, and, and you don't think, you just answer. Right, yeah. First thing that comes, and they said, if your mother were dead, would you go on and become a priest? And I said, no. Right. And I don't remember that at all. I was under. Right. But when he read that to me, it it hit me. Right. I'm get. I, my mom wants a priest. Right. Are you doing this because your mother would be very proud of you? Yeah. It? Right. Okay. And that's not a good enough reason. Right. Exactly. So when I came right up to retreat for ordination, I thought I don't have a vocation. And my my uncle Bishop Persley from Fort Wayne, South Bend, at that time was right. You talk about there. him in the book as well because of some discussions at the USCCB, right? Right. At, uh, Bishop's right. Conference, he right. was great. Very strong pro life. Right. But anyway, uh, I talked to him. He was going to ordain me, mm -hmm. and I just said, "I don't, I don't have a vocation. I cannot be the have the, the only mass I attend is my own. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that I can do that." Mm -hmm. And he was he was surprised, but they went along with it, and mm -hmm. it broke my heart, mother, my mother's heart, until I brought Annie home. <laughs> oh, okay. Then, that, then, uh, then, do, the, the, your father was not big on you being a priest, was he? No, he, he had two brothers who were priests, and when I came, and he home, said he had never really thought about being a priest. He said I never wanted to be a priest, priest right. and he yeah. dropped it. Didn't bother him at all, but it really did hurt my mother. So you did have a lot of family pressure in a sense that you had all these. I did because and I had a, a brother Jim who had spent six years in the seminary and left and became a doctor. And he's a very successful doctor in Indianapolis. I had another brother, Bob, who went nine years in the seminary and dropped out. Mm -hmm. So it, I was the last hope, really, okay. and uh, I didn't become a priest. Right. Okay. Now it's also when you first went, you went to work for the uh, Illinois Right to Life Committee, or at least that's what it became called, and you were kind of doing public relations work. But you you left there because you said I believed in direct action. Right. Why did you believe that, and what does that mean in your mind? Well, one thing, I believed in the pictures. I believe you had to see what abortion does to a fellow human being. They didn't like that too well. In mm -hmm. fact, we had, we had an exhibit up in City Hall, and one of their, uh, actually a, an officer in Illinois Right to Life, tore the picture down mm -hmm. and threw it across. And that picture was important. And, and our booth was the most popular booth because we did have a film running. That, that showed the baby mm -hmm. in the womb and then the baby after it was aborted. And people were swarming around our booth. The others were kind of, you know, here and there. But uh, that was part of it. And also I went down to Notre Dame when Birch Bayh was speaking. And I stood up in the auditorium just as he was ready to talk. And I said, Birch Bayh, why do you support abortion? Something like that. And the whole place, you know, people started booing me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that kind of hurt the image of the of the Illinois Right to Life I see, Committee. Okay. That was part of because a lot of people at that called the Right to Life I office about you. and said this guy ruined the graduation. You know, like, oh, you graduate once, and he stood up and made a spectacle of himself, right. things like that. And I wouldn't. Tom uh, Roser was was a buddy of mine, and Bart Heffernan, and some of these do uh, doctors and lawyers. Uh, they understood what I was doing mm -hmm. and why I had to do it, but the rest of the board did not like it, and so I, they were going to fire so me. You went off on your own then? 
I, I started my own group pro, uh, Pro-Life Action League. What's your connection with the Thomas More Society? Well, we got it started. Okay. My wife's the chairman of their board. Okay. Uh, we had to have a, a lawyer who understood RICO. Racketeering is is tough. And yeah, that's where the title comes from, the racketeer. Racketeer you're for life. Accused of, under the RICO statute. Right. right. They first accused me under uh, violating the Sherman Clayton. And those were originally uh, promulgated to go after the mafia. Right. Right. Organized the crime. The kingpin. Right. Yeah, that's what the racketeer is. He yeah. sits back. Somebody else does the crimes. He gets the money. And and he uh, and that's what they were trying to charge me with. And the thing is, the penalty is triple damages. Whatever damages that the, the uh, okay. court comes up with, you have to triple those. Mm -hmm. And they they wanted that. They wanted to break the movement. The idea was if they can t uh, get Joe Scheider to stop, mm -hmm. uh, scare him off, we can scare off the, the activists. Because we, we're bothering them. We're mm -hmm. cutting down their business, their clinics are closing and so on, doctors are converting. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was due to our activities, our aggressive activities. So they needed to shut you down. They, they, they wanted very desperately to shut us down. Right. And it, by coincidence, I had gone, there was a, a gal who ran uh, abortion clinics in Wilmington, Delaware, down in Florida, in Chicago. I went to all her clinics for some odd reason. I didn't know, I didn't plan that, it, she, but she had 12 clinics, so you're bound to hit them. And uh, she was one of the instigators of the racketeering thing. Okay, because you were targeting her systematically. Yes, yeah, and she, she saw it as a systematic effort to shut her, her down. down. Right. Okay. And so she got together with some other right. pro boards and, and they filed this suit. Right. And I didn't think much of it. It was handed to me while I was picketing a, a National Abortion Federation Convention. Did somebody come out and get, hand you an envelope? Somebody, right. I mean, I, I just thought, well, so what is what? this? Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what, what, what was the Lindbergh baby's kidnapping? Why did that impact you? Well, because I was a little kid when, when uh, little Charlie Jr. was kidnapped. and. Apparently he was dropped when they were taken down a rickety ladder and buried. Mm -hmm. uh, he was dead, but the guy went ahead and wanted the ransom. Mm -hmm. And so this was big news. I'm from a little town in Indiana, Hartford City. We never had newsboys out or anything, but extra, extra read all about it. Okay. The Lindbergh baby kidnapped. And so right. I had a little sister, Ellie, and shortly after that, a little brother, Bobby. And I thought they'd take babies. They would take babies out of their mm -hmm. cribs and get money for it. Right. And so I think it just, I was, I was at that impressionable age, and so defending little children, right. you know, babies and so on, just seemed, uh, I was concerned about right. that, and, th and that stayed with me. You also talk about the fact that when you went and visited Dachau and the connection to the Scheidler family. What, what was the issue well, there for I, you? I was I was bicycling through Europe and I was okay. in Munich by myself, and I thought, well, you're only about 12 miles from Dachau. I'll go out and see it. It was still intact. All the bar barracks were up, and the wire, and our bike knocked fry over the uh, labor makes you free. Free, right. Anyway, so I went in. I spent an afternoon in Dachau going to the barracks, and it was, it was kind of like no guide or anything, just roam around. And I was going to stay in town, a beautiful little city right, right outside, and I couldn't. The, the gloom and, and the fact that all these deaths, all these deaths that took place, that people starved to death and so on. So I went back to Munich and uh, went to Mass and they were having a massive reparation. But that Dachau thing was, uh, was important to me because it, was, it, it showed what can happen to a society. They take innocent lives and that's what abortion is. Mm -hmm. And I, so I went to the phone book. I thought, what did the Scheidlers do mm -hmm. during Dachau? They must have known about it. And I looked, and there were 18 Scheidlers, because that's where we're from. Mm -hmm. We're from that southern Bavaria. Oh, I see. And so I thought, what would I have done if I had been one of these Munich Scheidlers? Would I have done anything about Dachau? And I didn't have a good answer. Right. And I thought, well, I'd have to get in the underground or something, mm -hmm. because if I knew they were killing people out there. So this comes up in America. Same thing, right. basically. We're going to kill human beings under the law. That's the law of the land. We can kill our right. posterity. We can kill every baby unborn, and we would die as a country. What can I do? I'm a Scheidler. I'm at Dachau now. 
I got to do something. Okay. So that impacted you. It impacted which, me. Which going enough. forward. Yeah. It's interesting, too, in, in a chapter on raw judicial power, you talk about Roe v. Wade and, and Doe Bolton, the other case that most people don't think about, but right. happened at the same time. But this was the part I didn't, I didn't know about. It was in 1962 that the abortion issue broke into a wider national conscience. The host of the children's program, Romper Room, Miss Sherry Finkbein of Phoenix, Arizona. Right. What happened with her? Well, her husband came back from a trip to Europe. He was a teacher and he had taken a, a, a group of students and he had a headache and he, and he used a thing called thalidomide. Mm -hmm. Happened to be good for headaches. Right. Well, they found out uh, they were taking it uh, in Europe and the babies were being born with right. little fins and, right. and uh, no lay, you know. Right. It affected the baby if you were pregnant. So uh, Sherry Finkbein was pregnant and her husband came home with the thalidomide and she took some for a headache. Right. And then she got scared and she thought, I'm gonna have a, a, a deformed baby. So she signed up at the hospital locally and they were gonna do an abortion for health reasons. And that was allowed, it was legal, but she started wanting to warn other women, if you've got thalidomide around, don't take it if you're pregnant. It'll deform your baby, mm -hmm. maybe. It was like less than 10%, but anyway, Oh, is it really only that amount? Yeah, it wasn't much, okay. if, if, if even that. But, but that's still horrible, obviously, right? Yeah, and, and so that was her point. And, uh, but she did, could, then the hospital said, we're not gonna, it was probably, everybody in the United States knew about it, so the hospital canceled right. the abortion, so she flew to Sweden and got it there. And they did say the baby was deformed. Right. Anyway, that got people thinking about deformed babies, ba a bad birth, so on. And she got an abortion for okay. that. And that's just sort of opened the door. Okay, interesting. You know, issue. obviously there's so much in this book where uh, this is just a taste of what that's, people are gonna read, but you've got a myriad of pictures in your who's who, Ronald Reagan, everybody you met. One of the people that strikes me, and you, met, you talk about him, is that you were on so many television shows and you got a picture of you with Phil Donahue, who used right. to be incredibly popular, right. and I believe was a Notre Dame guy yeah, himself. Right. Right. Uh, and you actually say that you, you and him were sort of like buddies. In what way did you meet? Well, we ran around a lot together. He was interested in the abortion thing. He'd go to the clinic with me. They'd have the cameras there. Mm -hmm. Then he wanted me on his program to talk about it. And, and uh, my understanding was I could use pictures. But uh, he said romper room uh, is right before our program. Or, or it was the Bozo Circus. Bozo Circus That's and right. all the little kids watching. Right. And he said some of the little kids might still be watching TV, the moms might, mm -hmm. and these pictures would offend them. So we got to put, he didn't say we'll cancel the program, we'll put it in the evening. Well, I thought that's not going to get the coverage. I want women to see this thing. Right. I want to show, stop right. abortion. Yeah, to me, it was a tool. For him, it was But a Phil tool. was very pro abortion, wouldn't you say? Uh, not very. Okay. He was sort of like. Because he did have one on his show, I remember. Oh, yeah. Actually having one. Yeah, on we show. went to that show, too, and yeah. Randy Terry was on with her. Yeah. But we, uh, he, he was kind of like so many uh, people that they don't like abortion, but it's a woman's right. What right. can I say? I can't uh, be their right. conscience and so on. Right. And, and we've got that. We get that uh, forever. Uh, right. Birch Bay was really not pro-abortion. He would would talk at pro-life events, right. but he he also would support abortion. Right. You also yeah. talk about as a chapter in here, which is interesting, uh, regarding the seamless garment. Right. And we hear about that a little bit again today. That kind of went away for a while. And and you've got a story here about Malcolm Mugridge and a, a discussion with a woman named Eileen Egan, I believe. And he says, right. well, you know, Eileen told Malcolm, the same goes for capital. If you're against taking life, the life of the unborn, or life of the born, then it all goes together. The protection of life is a seamless garment. You can't protect some lives and not others. And he, his point was, well, there's a certain defense ability. You know, the country can be defended. But this is sometimes we hear this seamless garment, which in many ways is true, but sometimes can be misused, right? Well, yeah, it, it puts the abortion, which is the ab abject taking of, of an innocent human life, in the same category with capital punishment and, uh, and almost anything that uh, would take a life. Some, sometimes you have to take a life. Right. And sometimes it gets extended beyond that to like how you treat people or, or 
t intolerance or even poverty and things like that almost get put onto the same. And so, sphere, so abortion so. is just part. Right. And for for us, abortion was the issue. Right. It was definitely the taking of an innocent, helpless human being. So you also but mentioned so many people in this book. One of my my great friend Jerry Horn from Priest for Life oh, is great. mentioned in there as well. Uh, how long did it take you actually put this together then? Well. I, I have, both, you know, I had wrote notes. I, I had a daily hotline where I would, uh, people would have to call in. And so I had boxes and boxes, thousands of those. I had letters, clippings. Right. So I when you went to start to put it together, how long did it take? It, uh, a couple of years. A couple of years? A couple of years, yeah. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joe Scheidler, for standing up for the unborn all these years, and I'm sure taking it on the chin many times when it would have been nicer to be at home or teaching at Notre Dame. And the book is Racketeer for Life, Fighting the Culture of Death from the Sidewalk to the Supreme Court, published by TAN, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, a history, really, of the pro-life movement. Definitely worth a read. Check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.